Well, good morning. Glad you guys are here. That last song will get you going, won't it? I was in the back. Yeah, hearing y'all sing, I was, I was getting fired up. Um, so I'm excited. Hope you guys are excited. We're glad you guys are here uh, to worship with us this morning. We're wrapping up our series today uh, called Not Today, Satan. And uh, my prayer um, over the last, uh, the past three weeks has been that the Holy Spirit would, would sort of peel back uh, some of the layers of like the, the, the lies, the misconceptions, uh, the rumors surrounding our enemy, Satan, because there's a lot of them out there, a lot of misunderstandings, a lot of things that we think are right, but maybe they're not. And, uh, and so my prayer is that we would begin to, that as we've worked through this, that we would begin uh, to see him as he really is, right? And in turn, not be deceived uh, like when, when, when he attempts to, to gain a foothold um, in our lives. And um, as we've talked about, uh, sorry, as we've, and we've talked about the fact that Satan is, is a, a, a very real entity, right? We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that he's not a general force. He's not like a symbol for evil, but he's a real being with, with real desires, with real plans, and with real schemes. And last week, uh, we talked about uh, the tactics that uh, uh, we talked tactics, right? And, 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 ha- and we learned that, that the primary weapon that Satan uses against us is temptation, Right? And then he most often when he approaches us with that, he approaches us at the crossroads of, um, of weakness and, and opportunity. So we need to take every thought captive, right? That that's, that's the call, especially when we're in a place of weakness. We need to take those thoughts captive. We need to put it up against scripture, put it up against God's word, and then allow the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth to us, to reveal the truth of the situation, what's really going on, where we're at, what those thoughts mean. And this week, um, I want us to talk response. Um, what, what do we do once we realize we're under attack? Um, how, do, how do we protect ourselves? How do we guard ourselves against Satan's attack? So if you've got your Bibles, uh, go ahead and open them to um, Ephesians 6. That's where we're gonna be camped out uh, as we work our way through uh, today. So while, while you guys are doing that, um, a couple of, I guess about two months ago or so, my family uh, and I, we went to Tennessee um, with sort of a, a Taylor had, had uh, my wife had set up a uh, sort of a family get together with, with her grandmother and like everyone from, from her side of the family. So it was this huge thing. She spent all this time getting it together and we rented this big old, it was at a retreat center. So it was like a lodge, right? And so there was like 25 of us there and it was a ton of fun. And as soon as we started talking about going to Tennessee, we were in the mountains. Um, if you know anything about the Phillips boys, we love to fish. And so for like two months, all I heard about was, we're going to catch trout. We're going to be down in the rivers. That's what we're going to do. Forget the family. We want to go to the river. It was one of those things. And so that's what we did, right? Jonah did all this research on the baits and how to, all, all, all the things. And so Taylor did all this planning, and she told me, she said, Jay, your only job, because I am not a detail-oriented person, my only job was to make sure that the fishing stuff got packed. So I was like, I got you, sweetie. I can do that. So packing day came. We started loading stuff in the car, and we had the tackle boxes out, and we took the fishing reels off the rods and put everything in the car and got everything packed up, jumped in the car, and we took off. Everything was packed. Everything was ready. About two and a half, three hours into the drive down, it became clear that we had left our fishing rods. I say we. I had left the, 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 the fishing rods. And, um, and needless to say, the kids were devastated and it was, it was, it was awful. Um, and so we had to make some adjustments to make things work. We were still able to fish, but it involved a trip to Walmart. Um, but you see, the thing is, I had done all the prep work on the front end. Like we had done it. I had worked it out. We had everything ready to go. We were ready to fish, but all the preparation in the world doesn't, doesn't add up to anything if you don't actually have a rod to fish with right? Uh, and, and in order for us to be successful in defeating Satan in our lives, we have to lay the groundwork before we get to the battle, okay? Preparation is the key to victory over sin. To, to wait for the battle to approach uh, before preparing is akin to showing up to fish in a river, having all the lures, having all the baits, knowing all the tactics, having all the things, and um, not having a fishing, uh, fishing rod to fish with. Right? You, can, you can't catch fish without a rod, and you can't properly defend yourself against Satan if you're not completely dressed for battle. 
okay? And, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. Our text this morning, it comes from, from the end of the book of Ephesians, all right? So Paul has spent his letter to the Ephesians, encouraging them to be unified um, in, in, in Christ as one body. He writes about their salvation as a result of the power of Christ's resurrection. And then he tells them to walk in that power, to walk in the power that's available to them through the Holy Spirit, right? They have power available to them as uh, to live out God's call on their lives every day. And then he closes his letter by, by laying out a list of things, right? Um, uh, of particular ways that that power should play out in their lives, right? And in their relationships. He, uh, he's just finished, before we get to our passage, he just finished giving instruction to, to husbands, to wives, to children, even to slaves at the end of chapter six. He tells them, this is how you're supposed to live. This is what you're supposed to do. This is how it works as a reborn citizen of, citizen of heaven. These are the things that you, that this is what it should look like in your life. And then he writes this. Okay, so he's just given them this long list and then he writes this. We're gonna pick it up in Ephesians six, verse 10. It says, finally, be strengthened by the Lord in his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. So there have been entire books written on this particular passage of scripture, okay? Entire books, Bible studies, a whole bunch of stuff. And we don't have the kind of time for me to dive super deep into detail. And I don't want to exhaust you because that's what would happen. So uh, what I'm going to do today is sort of give you an, an overview of the armor of God and then jump into, uh, jump in a little deeper into a few of them as we go, Okay. So number one, if you're taking notes, first thing Paul tells them to do is to suit up, okay? Paul has just finished this long list of life application points for the Ephesians, right? He said, this is what it looks like in your family. This is how, this is how it should work. As a Christian husband, as a wife, a son, or a daughter, here's what you should do. Here's how you serve God in that context. And then he lays out a list of how-tos, and then he says, but you can't do this on your own, right? You're going to need strength, Okay, you, you, you have to draw your strength from your heavenly father. And here's how you do that. Make sure you put on the armor of God. Make sure you suit up first. He tells them to put on the armor of God. You wanna be strong in your faith? You wanna be able to, to, to walk this thing? You wanna be able to do this? Suit up. That's what he says. And Paul wrote a lot about the notion of, of you see it in all of his letters, of putting off and, and, and putting on. In Ephesians uh, chapter four, uh, just about a chapter and a half earlier, he says this um, in, uh, in, in verse 22, he tells them to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit, uh, renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteous, um, in righteousness and purity of the faith. So he likens our spiritual journey to, to putting on or a jacket or, or taking off a shirt, right? We, we're, we're called to take off the parts um, uh, of us that, that aren't pleasing to God and then replace them with something that God gives us, clothe ourselves in that. We put on the new self, that new man that, he, that Paul refers to all the time that's created when Jesus forgives us of our sins and he changes us, right? That's the new man and we're supposed to put that on. And then we have to protect that new man we have to protect him from the schemes of the devil because that's what they are, right? They're schemes, they're plans. He's, he's working this thing. Satan is, is trying to work his plan just like God is working his plan in, in, in our world, right? So the way that we guard ourselves against Satan's lies is by making the choice to suit up in the full armor of God every day. And it's important that we understand that that's a choice to do every day, that we make the choice to put it on or not, right? And then he says, next thing that we need to do after we suit up is that we need to know who it is that we're really fighting. Look at verse 12. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil, against evil spiritual forces, in, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. So he, he tells them to suit up um, and then number two, he says, you need to identify your true enemy. Right? Paul wants the Ephesians to understand that their fight is not with those in this world, but with powers outside of it. And we, we talked about this last week, but when Satan 
tempts, when he approaches, he usually approaches us with a lie that's meant to distract us from the truth that God has for us, right? That's the way that he goes, right? It's a, it's a lie, we buy into that lie, it goes against the truth of God's word or, or what God has for us. And his lies are meant, they're meant to draw us away into sin. And at the same time, they're meant to cause confusion, right? As to who it is that we're really supposed to be fighting. So I've got this video that I wanna show you guys and I'm gonna move this out of the way so y'all can see it. Um, it's super short. And I want you to know that this is apparently, as I was doing some research, this is a super common thing that uh, happens all over the place. Um, but like I said, it's only about 30 seconds long, but I want you to notice there's a bird and a couple of cats in this video, okay? So I want y'all to watch this. Okay, y'all see that? Okay, I think that's the perfect example of what Satan does in our lives. Okay, um, that's exactly what he does. He begins to poke, he begins to prod into our lives, he begins to work his way in, and he pokes and pokes and pokes until we give in. And after that, guys, our sin nature takes over, right? He, uh, but, <laughs> but when that happens, who do we go after, right? Not Satan. He's not the one that we go after. The cats didn't go after the crow. They went after each other, right? Now, they may have been close to getting into it, okay, before the crow showed up. They may have been close, but make no mistake, the crow is the one that struck the match that started that fight, right? And we do the same thing. We find ourselves in a bad space. We're dealing with something. We're struggling or whatever it might be. And instead of turning to God for help, we take it out on our families, Right? We, blame it, we blame it on our spouses for not being enough or for being too much, right? Or we blame it on, on our kids because they're bugging us or, 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 or because they're not perfect like we know they should be, right? And, and it's not just our families. We don't, we, when we don't take the time to identify who the enemy really is in our lives, we tend to go after whoever's closest, the first person that comes up. And the end result is that it hurts us, it damages relationships, and ultimately it hinders the advancement of the kingdom of God in our lives, okay? We need to identify our enemy. We need to understand who it is that we're really fighting against. It's not flesh and blood. It's spirits and principalities and authorities. Satan is the enemy, not you and me, and not the world out there, okay? They're not the enemy, so we suit up, we identify our true enemy, and once we've done that, we stand. And in verse 13, Paul says, for this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist, uh, you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having prepared everything to take your stand, stand therefore. So you suit up so you can stand and resist, right? And that seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? I mean, we suit up for battle, you put on the armor, you, you, you suit up so that you can do what? So that you can go and fight, right? So that you can get out there. I mean, I've got all this armor on. Let me go out there and charge hell with a water pistol, right? That's what we do. But, but that's not the job. That's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying that we stand. We stand. God fights. In this passage, we're called to prepare ourselves, right? And when we've made all the right preparations, when we've done all the things on the front end of this, we're dressed, we're ready for battle, we stand and resist. And I think the order is important, right? You don't, you don't suit up, right? Or you suit up so you can stand. You don't stand and then suit up when necessary. And I think that's really important. We can't wait until we see the battle coming to suit up because by that point, it's gonna be too late, guys. It's gonna be too late. We have to make preparations now before the battle gets here. So what does that mean? How do I prepare for battle when I don't, I don't know what type of battle it's gonna be? I, I don't know what it's gonna look like. I don't know how Satan's gonna come after me. So, so, so how do I prepare? Well, practically speaking, just nuts and bolts, um, in my own life, the way it plays out is... is uh, mainly through God's word, right? We have his word available to us, or right? We should be in it. We should be in it, studying his word on a regular basis. And by regular, I don't, I don't just mean 
on Sundays when you're here at church, okay? Showing up here on Sundays is great, okay? It is fantastic. I'm glad you're here, right? It is, it, it is, it is great, but it isn't, it's not a substitute for daily study and time with God. It, it's not. This experience in here, um, this should be like our heavenly pep rally, okay? Like that's, that's what this should be, right? We should be celebrating what God is doing in our lives here, right? What he's done, how he's shown up, what sort of things has happened. We should be celebrating that in our lives out, you know, that he's, things that he's done out there, we should be celebrating in here when we gather, right? We learn in this space, okay? That's, that's what I come up here to do. I come up here to teach and, and hopefully we learn and the spirit moves and, and these things happen. But it's not enough to sustain you from one Sunday to the next, right? You have to be in the word on your own because the thing that happens there, right? Digesting it, uh, just you and God, because one of the things you learn when you start doing that is you learn to hear God's voice in your own life. You learn to hear him speak to you through his word, not just from somebody up here on stage talking to you. You learn to, to hear God in your own life. And however, I, I do think that we all need deep, functional Christian relationships, okay? I do believe that. We need to learn from one another. I mean, an army isn't just one person, right? It's multiple people. And we've got brothers and sisters in arms in this room right now. Have you ever stopped to think that, that, that someone in this room um, or, or in your small group might have already been through and conquered the exact same battle that you're facing right now? I mean, they may, they may have been through exactly what you're going through. They might have some godly insight or, or some wisdom that they can give you that could quite possibly be just what you need to stand and resist. But if you don't invest here, right? If you don't be, if you're not here, here, if you don't, uh, if you don't get into a small group, if you don't join a Bible study, if you don't allow yourself to be known, you're not gonna hear it. If it only happens in this space, right? If your only exposure here is in this place, we're glad you're here and we welcome you, we want you here, but it's gotta be more than just Sundays. We suit up, we identify our enemy, and we stand. But what are we wearing? Let's get into it, shall we? Verse 14. Stand, therefore, with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. So truth is important, right? The, the, the truth revealed in the gospel. In Ephesians 1, Paul opens his, uh, opens his letter to them in, in verse 13. He says, In him you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. So we should, we should be people of truth, right, in our language, in, in our behavior, in, in our attitudes. That's what he's talking about when he, when, he, when he talks about the belt of truth. Truth should mark our lives. That means that we don't tell half-truths, okay? The, the, the Christian doesn't tell half-truths. That means that the Christian uh, doesn't tell the truth only when it's convenient, right? We speak truth even when it hurts, right? Even when it hurts us. But but we speak the truth in love as well. All right, Paul covered all his bases in Ephesians because if you go to Ephesians 4, he says, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. So speaking that truth in love is an important thing. Um, I was a worship pastor for 20 years before I stepped into this, into this role. And um, one of the things that comes with uh, being a worship pastor is being part of a worship team, right? Having a team of people. And one of the things that was part of being a team of people was people had to join a worship team. And when you join a worship team, you have to be able to sing. You have to be able to play an instrument effectively, right? I mean, you need to be able to do those things. So I had auditions and I had to speak the truth in love more than once when somebody would come up and audition and I had to look at them and say, listen, God loves you. He has gifted you, but this is not an area that he has gifted you in right? Now that may come across like some of you may think that's harsh, that's harsh, but here's the thing. How unloving is it to put someone up here to lead a group? Of, and I don't just mean this space. I mean, in general, I mean, in all the places I've been, but how unloving is it to put someone on stage to lead people in worship and they can't sing? How much more of a distraction is that than to put someone up here who can? You follow me on that? It's, it would be unloving to put someone in any position that they're not equipped to do. Okay. 
That's, that's, what, that's why speaking the truth in love is important. We should be people of truth in our language, our behavior, in, 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 in our attitudes. And here's why truth telling is so important, guys, because God is never honored when dishonesty is involved. Never honored. You will never honor God with a lie. If we're going to tell the truth, we have to, if we're going to be a people of truth, we have to tell the truth because uh, the, the world, if we want the world to listen, we have to be a people of truth with ourselves and with one another because otherwise, why would anyone in the world listen to us if we're not willing to speak the truth? They're not going to listen to us. They won't listen to a word that we have to say. We have to be a people of truth. The second one is the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is a big churchy word that just means right standing with God. Um, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, uh, Paul says this, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So it, in Christ, in Christ, what he did for us on the cross, we have right standing with God. We call that imputed righteousness. That's another fancy church word. Um, Jesus imputed his righteousness. He poured it on us. He put it in us. He gave it to us, poured it out on us through his death on the cross, okay? His righteousness became ours, right? And as a result, we're given right standing with God. That's the sacrifice, okay? We're giving right standing with God through Jesus and nothing can change that, okay? Jesus did it. He accomplished it. Nothing can change that. But this passage isn't talking about imputed righteousness, okay? This passage is talking about uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, um, practical righteousness, like right living. That's what this passage is talking about, right? It means that our lives, it means that our behaviors are marked by Christ, right? That we don't live in the same way that the world does, right? We're set apart. We're called to live. We live, we live holy lives. We put, we, we put away the things of the world. In short, what, that, what the breastplate of righteousness means is that we don't dabble in sin, that's not a regular part of our lives. It means that through the Holy Spirit, we do our level best to live as God's word tells us to live. And that may seem basic, right? Do what the Bible says. Oh, of course, that's what Christians do, right? But we don't nail it. I don't. I messed it up yesterday, right? Like we don't, we don't, we don't always nail it. It doesn't mean that we get everything right all the time. That is not what it means, okay? Because we all know, we know that we don't get it right all the time. But putting on the breastplate of righteousness means that we live a lifestyle that reflects Christ. That's what it means. That by and large, our lives look like the life that Jesus lived, okay? The next one is feet sandaled with the readiness for the gospel of peace. And this is the one that when I read this passage um, that I, I'm tended to just sort of blast by, right? Oh, feet sandal with the red, it's the gospel. Okay, let's, let's move on to the next. But here's the thing. Shoes are important, right? We, they, they allow us to travel from one place to another. Now, it's different now than it was back then, right? I mean, shoes now are, are, are an accessory, right? You want, you want cool kicks or whatever, right? I mean, honestly, go home and flip open your closet and tell me it's not an accessory, right? You've got... 42 pairs of shoes, you know, on a rack, hanging them on the, anyways, sorry. Um, but but it, it, it's not the same. Back then, shoes were important. Shoes could make or break an army, right? Without correct footwear, an army couldn't run, they couldn't maneuver, they couldn't adjust, um, they, they couldn't move over difficult terrain. The wrong shoes could cost an army a war. And the Roman army, the most powerful army in the world at that time, that at the time that Paul was writing this letter, man, they had great, great shoes. They, um, every soldier had, had thick leather-soled sandals that, that, that allowed them to pursue the enemy. They allowed them to adjust. They could, go, they could go into every nook and cranny they needed to to pursue the enemy. And the idea is the same for us, right? We should always be ready to share the gospel message, right? And just like every Roman soldier had a pair of sandals, we are all called to put on the armor. No one is exempt. No one is exempt from the message, from sharing the message of Christ. And here's the thing, guys, each one of us, I've said this before, each one of us, each one of you is uniquely positioned right where you are to take the gospel into your particular nook. Every one of you, you're right where God wants you to be 
to deliver the message of the gospel into the space that you're in. And Paul calls it the gospel of peace. In, uh, in John 14, Jesus says, he's talking to the disciples, he says, peace I leave to you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. Right? We've been given a message of peace, guys, right in the middle of a war zone. Been given a message of peace. It brought peace into your life, didn't it? Right? All you're called to do is share your story. That's it, what Christ did for you. Share the peace that you received and then let the Holy Spirit do the rest. That's the thing about the gospel. Our job is to share. Holy Spirit takes care of the rest. Amen. If it's received, praise God. If it's not received, praise God. He's the one in control, not me. And in verse 16, it says, in every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So the next is, is, is the shield of faith. So the shield Paul would have been talking about was, was a, um, a Roman scutum. That's a fun word, scutum. Um, sorry. Anyways, um, it, <laughs> my bad. Uh, it, it, it wasn't like what we tend to think of when we think of a shield, right? If you think about it, if you ever watch Knights or any of those types of shows, it wasn't a shield like we tend to think of. It was large enough to cover a fully standing man from like the, the, about halfway up his shin to above his shoulder. Okay, it was a large shield, basically covered his entire body. And scripture, more than once, I don't have time to pull the references this morning because we'll be here till after lunch if I do. Um, but scripture refers to God as our shield over and over and over again. That he stands between us and our enemies. He stands between us and, 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 and the devil. So he refers to him, he, God, he refers to God as our shield many times. And, and our belief in the promises of God, our belief in the promises of God is what protects us. That's what shields us. And here's what I mean. Um, we didn't talk about this last week, but when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, two of the three temptations that he used were aimed at Jesus's identity, okay? The first one was, if you are the son of God, turn this rock into bread, right? We talked about rock bread, remember that? And then the second one was, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down and God will save you, right? And so often that's how Satan attacks us as well. Okay, he goes after our identity as children of God. He says, you are such a screw up. Nobody loves you. God's looking down from heaven with like, like a frown on his face. He's disappointed in you, right? And here's the thing. When Satan attacks, he almost always goes at us and defines us by our actions, okay? You're not someone who tells lies. You're a liar, you understand? You're not someone who sometimes drinks too much. You're a drunk. You follow me with that? Does that make sense? He goes after, he, he always goes at our identity. He doesn't say this is something you struggle with. He says, this is what you are. And he tries to get us to see ourselves that way. If he can get us to believe that's the lie. If he can get us to believe that, that's what he's going after. But God defines us, guys, not by who we are, but he defines us by his son's redeeming sacrifice, Right? He says, you're my beloved child. You're a high priest. You're a citizen of heaven. That's who you are as a follower of Christ, right? And our faith in those promises of God, our belief in what God says about us, that's what protects us. That's the shield. So when Satan attacks with a lie, God doesn't love you because you're a sinner, we respond with, yeah, you're right, I messed up, but my sins don't define me because Jesus paid the price and his word says that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And our belief in that is what shields us from the lies of heaven, or uh, lies of hell, sorry, that would be bad, <laughs> right? Everyone's gonna walk out here going, what did he just say? No, no, and, and we choose, as we choose to believe what God's word says, what God says about us, what he says becomes ours to hold on to, right? And those fiery darts of accusation that Satan throws, they're extinguished by the loving promises of our heavenly father. In verse 17, it says, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So the helmet of salvation. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul calls the helmet, um, he calls it uh, the helmet of the hope of our salvation. In verse eight, in uh, chapter five there, he says, but since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled and put on the armor of faith and love and a helmet of the hope of salvation. We have to put on the hope 
that we have in Christ. Not just who we are, but the hope that we have in him, the eternal blessing that we have in him, right? To, to stand and resist the devil, we have to be assured of our salvation, right? Not just our identity, but, but, but assured that we belong to God. Um, growing up, I dealt, um, I dealt with doubt a lot. Uh, maybe it's because of where I grew up in the South. I'm not sure, but every time the preacher would, <laughs> would, would uh, every time the preacher would come up and preach a sermon and then talk about uh, coming to Christ, he'd say, "You need to know that you know Jesus." Is the way he would do it. And every time he said that, I would think, "Do I know?" Right? That's where I would go. I, I would begin to doubt if I really knew Jesus. Did I really mean it when I gave my life to Jesus? Maybe I didn't right? I'm struggling. Maybe I didn't. Um, and, and I dealt with doubt about my salvation for a long time. And here's the thing. If Satan can create doubt in our hearts about whether or not we really know Christ, guys, he can take us right out of the game. And it's not by chance that Paul calls it the helmet of salvation, because that's where this particular battle takes place, right? In our minds, right? We're, but we're not called to live in, in, in a place of doubt when it comes to our salvation and, and the eternity with Christ that, that it guarantees, right? God wants us to be confident children. He wants us to be confident of our standing as his children. That's why in 1 John verse 13, he says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son and the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. We can know 100% whether or not we have eternal life, right? God, God says, you know what, I, I can, we can take, I can remove all doubt that you are one of my children and that's where we're supposed to live. Um, let me tell you something, guys, that, that really helped me when I was going through my doubt. Um, if you're dealing with doubt, I, I want you to ask, ask yourself this question. Do I have a desire for the things of God? Do you wanna please him? Do you, do you want to know him more? Even if it's a little bit, even if it's a little desire, is, is there a part of you that says, you know, man, I really, I want this thing, right? I, I want my relationship to be right. If the answer is yes, even if you're not getting everything right, okay? E e even if you're, you're struggling, you're dealing with things, if there's a part of you that wants the things of God, I would argue that you know Christ and are one of his children. Because here's the thing, there is nothing in us that desires the things of God. There's nothing in us that desires the things of God, save for the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And the very fact that you desire to please God and have a relationship with him, even if it's a little, is evidence that you already have a relationship with him. You just may need to pay some more attention to it, right? Y'all track it with me on that? So now you may have, like I said, a, a lot of work to do, but if you weren't already a Christian, you wouldn't desire any of it. That's the Holy Spirit in your life wooing you back towards Christ. But, but if there's no desire, if you would say, yeah, I come to church and I hang out, but it's, you know, I kind of do my thing and I'm fine with that. If there's no desire for the things of God, then I would encourage you. Maybe you need to reevaluate your relationship. Because if you're a follower of Christ, there will always be a part of you that desires the things of God. And if you don't, that may be evidence that the Holy Spirit's not, not in here. But fortunately, we can help you with that today. <laughs> right? You can walk out of here with the firm knowledge that you were counted as a child in the kingdom of God. And you're going to have an opportunity to do that at the end of this service. Uh, last, uh, we're, we're told to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I told you I was kind of moving through these quick. We got a bunch of them. Um, but last, we're told to take up the sword of the Spirit, okay? And the sword is the only offensive weapon that, that we're given. And in almost all of Paul's writings, okay, in almost all of his writings, anytime you see the Word of God written down in text, it's the Greek word um, logos or logos, logos, however you want to pronounce it, right? And that, that literally means word, okay? But here in this passage, Paul uses the word rhema. Okay, he uses the Greek word rhema, which refers to the spoken word. Okay, so we're called to speak the gospel into dark places. Right? We go out into the world and we speak God's truth, just like the Roman army, into every nook and cranny. 
right? And as we speak his word into the lives of other people, the Holy Spirit will take it and he'll make it powerful, right? And we, as we speak it to one another, it, it helps us grow. It strengthens us. That's what happens in our small groups, right? We, we, we study scripture. We speak into one another's lives and then the Holy Spirit takes it and guys, he changes us. He starts to make adjustments in our lives. That's how we take it to the enemy, as it were. That's why, that's why we have to make every effort to position ourselves so that we are exposed to the sword of the Spirit in our own lives. Because if you're not, I know I've talked about small groups and it's not all about small groups, but this is like, to me, the most practical way to put this thing into practice. If you're not in a small group, I strongly encourage you to hop on our app or to hit up the website and find one, right? God's word, guys, it has power. It's, it, it, it's wisdom and it's knowledge, guys. They are life-changing, but we have to position ourselves to have it spoken into our lives if we wanna see any of that change. As we close, I've got, I've got one more thing that I want us to see, and this is, not in Ephesians, this is in, this is in Hebrews chapter four. So if you wanna write that down or if you wanna flip there real quick, I'll give you just a second. We're gonna be reading verses 15 and 16. And I want you to see this. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. The battles that we face, guys, the ones that we face every day, off and on, all the time, depending on where you're at, they can be exhausting, right? They can be exhausting. We're called to stand and resist, but guys, sometimes even just standing, for me, feels like too much after a while. We all get tired. But this passage tells us that we're not alone. Right? We, have a, we, we have a Savior who understands our weaknesses. We have a Savior who can identify with our temptations. Right? He knows what it means to be hungry. He knows what it means to be angry. Guys, he knows what it means to be annoyed with his friend. Okay? He understands all of that. He knows what it means to be tempted, and yet he lived a completely victorious life. In fact, Jesus understands the power of temptation better than anyone who's ever lived. And here's why that's a true statement. So the world knows very little of, of battling temptation, right? Because, because a, a temptation ceases to be a temptation when we give into it, right? Right? When we say, yes, it ceases to be a temptation, if, if only for a moment, right? There's, there, there's a momentary relief when, 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 when you give into something like that. So the world is always chasing after whatever, whatever it wants, right? That's what our culture teaches us. You want it? Go get it. It's yours to be had. You deserve it. Go take it. So that's what we do. We see the, the, the world sees something it wants, and the world goes and gets it. The Christian, I would argue, is more familiar with temptation than anyone in the world, as it were, right? Because we're called to live, li to live lives that go against that. We're called to live lives of self-denial, right? We, we live our lives by what God's word says and his word pushes back against our flesh, right? So we're, from, we're more familiar with temptation than, than the world is. From time to time, we fall, right? We give in to the power of temptation, but we're at least familiar uh, in a very real way with the battle, right? With, with, with that, that, that back and forth. Jesus... He never sinned, okay? He never sinned. He never succumbed to temptation. He stood strong and resisted. Guys, his entire life, he stood strong and resisted. He lived his entire life under the full weight of temptation. And unlike us, Jesus never felt the momentary relief of giving in to sin. C.S. Lewis says it this way. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. We never find out the strength of the evil, Im of the evil impulse, impulse inside us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he, he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows, the full, uh, knows to the full what temptation means. The only complete realist. Guys, Jesus' victory means that we have someone that we can go to when we're up against a temptation or a struggle that we're feeling uh, and, 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 and we're feeling weak, right? We, guys, we have somewhere to run, right? We can run to the throne of grace with boldness 
right? In fact, I would argue that the real call on the life of a Christian is to suit up, right? To suit up in the armor of God, run to the throne of grace, then stand and resist, right? That's how we stand and resist, by running to the throne of grace and finding mercy and finding strength from our Savior, right? He's our great high priest, right? He's mighty, he's awesome, he's powerful, he's loving, and guys, he's full of mercy. He gets us, folks. He gets us. He's been there. He understands. So we don't, we don't fight these battles on our own. In fact, we don't, like I said, we don't actually fight them, right? We suit up and we stand. And in Christ's love and mercy, he's the one who fights the battles. And when we do fall short, right, when we, when, when we do sin, we're still allowed to run to that same throne of grace, guys. We're allowed to go to that same place where we find strength and where we also find grace and mercy and forgiveness. So the call this morning is to suit up and stand, church. We're gonna close uh, with worship this morning and, and, and here's the call. Are you suiting up or, or have you left some of your armor at home in the closet? The breastplate of righteousness maybe, right? Um, does your life reflect that of the savior that you claim to worship? Right? Is, there, is there some sin that you need to deal with today in order to bring your life back into line with the armor that you're supposed to be wearing? And the way to do that is by confessing it before God, repenting of it, right? Turning away from it and then asking for accountability from a brother or sister to help you stand and resist from this point forward. Or uh, what about the helmet of salvation, I'm um, are you dealing with that nagging question of whether or not your life belongs to Christ? Like I said, we can help you nail that down today, right? We can either help you see that you are a child of God. There's a desire in you for the things of God and you are, and you need to step into that and you need to own that. Raise that shield of faith and trust in the promises of God that you are a redeemed, forgiven child of God. Or we can help you see that that's not where you're at, right? You don't, you, you aren't, that, that's not where you're not counted as one of God's children, but you know what? Then we can walk you through how you can give your life to Christ. But either way, you can walk out of here with the full confidence that you know that you are indeed a, a, a child of God. Or maybe there's another piece of armor that you've realized that you've, you need to put on uh, or that you need to put back on this morning. As we sing, we'll have people at the crosses uh, to my left and to my right uh, who this morning I'm calling armor bearers. That's what we're gonna call them this morning. And so they are over there uh, to, to meet with you. They're there to pray with you. They can help you suit up. Uh, they'd love, uh, they'd love to, to talk with you, to pray with you about any of the things that we've talked about today. If there's something else that you need prayer over that, they'd love to pray with you as well. So I'm gonna pray, we're gonna worship, and then uh, you guys will be dismissed. So let's pray. God, we come before you this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you provide a means, Lord, for us. You provide a means for us to fight back. You, you provide a means for us to stand strong in the faith and trust that you will fight our battles, God. Lord, I pray for clarity this morning. I ask you if you would open our eyes, Lord, to, to the things that you have for us, God, that you would reveal to us the nature, Lord. If there is some part of the armor that we are not putting on, Father, would you, would you move in us? Would you bring that to the surface, God? And would you, give us, would you give us the desire to put that piece back on, Lord, to deal with whatever it is that, that we're struggling with, whatever area that we have, we, we have, we have acquiesced to, to Satan in our lives, God, would you, would you move in? Would you allow us to suit up again and to protect ourselves from our enemy. Father, thank you for meeting with us here in, in this space, God. We love you and we praise you. It's in your son's name we pray. And everyone said...